Hey everybody, this is Nick from Android Headlines, and today we're going to be doing a review of the Google Pixel C. So the Google Pixel C is the newest Android tablet on the market. Actually, this is going to be Google's first 100% in-house design tablet. So what does that mean to everybody out there? Well, that means that you're going to be getting a 100% Google design and manufactured product unlike the Nexus products and a bunch of other Android tablets that have been out there for years. Android tablets don't exactly have a great name on the market and it's mostly because of the fact that the software just doesn't match up with the hardware. And in this case, not a whole lot has changed. So looking on the spec front, this thing is an absolute beast of a tablet. The front of the tablet, you're gonna find a large 10.2 inch LTPS IPS LCD display, if that's not enough acronyms for you. It's got a resolution of 2560 by 1800. That's 308 pixels per inch density. So this thing looks super crisp. It's really, really great looking display. It's probably about as good as LCD displays come outside of that 1500 to one contrast ratio, which certainly could be a little bit better. Under the hood, you're gonna find the latest from Nvidia. That's the Tegra X1 if you're keeping track. That's a quad core 1.9 gigahertz, 64 bit CPU. And it's got that brand new Maxwell class GPU for top tier performance. That's pretty much near desktop levels. You've got three gigs of LPDDR4 RAM, so we're talking some seriously fast RAM inside here. That's on par with the Nexus 6P and some other really top class Android devices as well. There's 32 gig or 64 gig of internal storage, and there's no micro SD card support, so make sure that you choose the right size for your needs. This one's gonna start at $500 for the 32 gig model. Those looking for the 64 gig model are gonna have to shell out an extra 100 bucks, which is pretty darn expensive for just a 32 gig upgrade in an internal storage space. And that keyboard is going to run you an extra 150 bucks if you're really interested in getting it. Looking at non-essential things like the 8 megapixel camera on the back and slightly more essential like the 2 megapixel camera on the front, we'll look at something that might be a little bit lacking depending on what you're going to be using these cameras for. There's of course Bluetooth 4.1 and dual band Wi-Fi, which is great news for those looking for 5 gigahertz support. Inside of that all aluminum back is a non-removable 9,000 milliamp hour battery, which is about three times the size of your average smartphone battery. So you're talking a pretty huge battery and it's going to give this one quite a bit of weight too at 517 grams. So you're looking at definitely one of the heavier tablets on the market in recent years. The whole experience is powered by 6.01 Marshmallow and monthly updates have been promised by Google. Although these are likely just security updates for the most part, rather than significant feature updates. Checking out the front of the tablet, we've got a one by the square root of two aspect ratio. Yes, that sounds a little weird, and that's because this is a brand new concept for an aspect ratio that, unlike a lot of other tablets that follow either the four by three old TV type aspect ratio, or the 16 by nine widescreen movie aspect ratio, this one is sort of in the middle and it works very well for apps and for movies as well. It's not quite as tall as that 4x3 display you're going to find on an iPad or a Nexus 9. And thankfully it's not as wide as the 16x9 display you're going to find on a lot of Samsung and other Android tablets out there. What's really special about this is not just that it works really well for all sorts of uses, but that this is sort of a mathematically perfect aspect ratio for screens. So you can divide this one into two or four pieces and each section of the screen is gonna give you the exact same ratio of display regardless of how many times you divide it. That works really well for apps and all sorts of other things and it keeps the screen in consistent dimensions so that it doesn't get confusing after splitting them up and changing the information around. Dividing a four by three or a 16 by nine display would create unequal splits in the display and make app use pretty awkward as you've probably encountered if you've ever used a tablet with this functionality. The biggest problem here of course is that, well, there's no actual multi-window support in stock Android at this time without any modifications. Custom kernels and custom ROMs and all that stuff can enable this feature, sure, but that's something that we've seen for years, and those looking to have a stock experience are going to be missing out. This is sort of puzzling given the Pixel C team's clear dedication to multi-window functionality with this amazing screen aspect ratio, but honestly it's not all that surprising given the complete disparity in app design and other inconsistencies we've seen from Google over the years. Likely a future update will bring multi-window support to stock Android, but users who have gotten used to Samsung's multi-window functionality or were even excited about Apple's new split screen functionality are going to be missing out. As a result, this means that the Pixel C is ultimately still a media consumption device rather than the productivity tablet that the amazing keyboard might suggest. Thankfully, the tablet is a beautiful one and features as many unique traits as it does borrowed ones from the industry. The anodized aluminum build is a thing of beauty and the metal buttons and other features give it an equally quality feel. The power buttons on the top right corner while the volume rocker is just around the side, putting both of these in the top corner of the tablet. 
Situated between these on the back is a small 8 megapixel camera without flash, which honestly is fine given that the heft of this tablet makes taking pictures pretty awkward and just generally less pleasurable than you might like. On both sides you'll find stereo speakers which produce absolutely phenomenal sound. It's loud, it's clean, it's clear, there's some bass here, they really just sound really good. And to be honest, when I was watching movies and stuff like that on my bed, on my couch, wherever I was, this sounded kind of like it was coming from a TV rather than from a tablet. It was really, really impressive. On the bottom left, you're going to find a USB Type-C, and that includes 15 watt charging, which means full charges in about three hours or so. And of course, don't forget that USB Type-C is fully reversible, so no more annoying flipping up and down like those micro USB cables I've had us doing for years. There's a 3.5 millimeter headset jack for audio output. On the right side, that's going to be caddy corner to the USB Type-C port. Moving around to the back, there's a beautiful light bar that perfectly complements the design of the tablet. This light bar is broken up into four multicolor LED sections. While the tablet's in use, the bar will be lit up in blue, red, yellow, and green Google colors. And when it's off, a simple double tap anywhere on the top of the tablet will light up the LEDs, showing the battery percentage in 25% increments. This is a really genius idea yet again from the hardware team that lets you check out the battery percentage on your tablet without even having to turn it on or flip it over. Moving on to the keyboard, this is a very well constructed keyboard and the metal back makes it super easy to use while it's sitting in your lap. There's four rubber feet found on this metal back and that helps to keep the whole experience sturdy when it's resting on the table so that it's not sliding all around since metal does have a bit less friction on it than maybe some other materials would. Keys on the keyboard feature a similar travel to that of a laptop, although the side keys are squished in to fit the form factor of the tablet. Typing is mostly natural even on the first use, although that tall enter button is likely to throw you for a loop a few times until you get used to it. There's a 500 milliamp hour battery inside the keyboard, and the brilliance here is how the keyboard physically connects to the tablet, which is going to be a magnetic plate in the lower quarter section of the back of the tablet, as well as a magnetic flap on the top of the keyboard. When these are placed together, the whole experience basically looks like a laptop, or something like a Surface, if you've gotten used to that type of design. Just a quick overview of how this magnet works. When it's closed, it looks sort of like a laptop. What you can do with the top is slide it right off the keyboard base, so it lets those magnets loosen up, and then you can place the back on the magnetic flap of the keyboard. This flap is excellent because it tilts up to 90 degrees, which is great for avoiding glare and other things like that depending on the situation you're in. To remove the tablet from the keyboard, you pull it all the way back until it's flat and then keep going. This will again loosen up the magnets and the tablet is free to roam from the keyboard. From this point you can either again face the tablet inward for storage, or you can actually flip it around and attach it backwards so that you can use the rubber feet for leverage on a table. This magnetic hinge is a really brilliant mechanic and it's incredibly strong too, allowing for shaking and all sorts of abuse without detaching it. While attached magnetically, the tablet will wirelessly charge the keyboard, ensuring that the keyboard will never die, which is great since there's no other ports or any other way to charge the keyboard itself. The keyboard is actually connected to the tablet via Bluetooth and requires no pairing codes normally, just stick it together via the magnets and it pairs automatically. Bluetooth connection was incredibly flaky though. Some days I found that it was solid and worked perfectly, while other days it was super inconsistent and honestly it just made the keyboard completely useless. This could be a defect in my unit or it could just be some software bugs that need to be worked out, but I know in some other devices I've had Bluetooth issues when the Marshmallow update came out, so this very well could be something deeper in Android that needs to be worked on. Multitasking via Alt-Tab and some other keyboard gestures was good, and it's a much better solution than having to press that overview button and scrolling on such a large display. Still, it may be along for multi-window, and I really can't wait till that update finally comes, because until then, this unfortunately just isn't much of a productivity device. Performance was phenomenal, all games ran perfectly, and the resolution of the tablet is absolutely insane. Graphics are crisp, clean, and clear. Some games like Asphalt 8 even have keyboard support for better control than a touchscreen can provide, especially when it comes to titles that need tactile feedback of buttons. Even games like Fallout Shelter and Mortal Kombat X were flawless, offering a more console-like visual experience than ever before. There was unfortunately some weird stuttering and hitching, as well as some apps locking up occasionally that tell me this experience isn't fully baked yet. We've seen some weird issues like this on Tegra Power devices in the past, and while this is considerably improved from those, it's still got some problems that I don't really see in other chipsets out there. Software updates will likely iron these things out, as the hardware is more than fast enough to run everything. In fact, this one tops out on the top of all the benchmarking charts out there. Looking more into the software, honestly, Android just isn't that tablet-friendly without modifications. This stems everywhere from the insane amounts of unused white space in the Google Now launcher, Google Now itself, the notification shade, Really, it's just all over the place. 
It's really obvious that Android has been made for a phone and it does not translate all that well to a tablet without some heavy modifications. For instance, the notification shade only takes up a fraction of the screen, yet it still hides info that should be shown given the fact that this is a 10.2 inch screen. There's also plenty of apps, including things like Google's own inbox and plenty of other Google apps that just aren't tablet optimized. They're basically giant versions of the phone app, and they just don't work all that well on a tablet considering most of the navigation requires lots of swipes, and because the screen is so large, you have to swipe quite far, and it becomes uncomfortable and awkward to use. Some apps like Gmail can show you how it's done with a nice pane on the left that can expand as you slide into and out from it, but there's still plenty of work to be done. The Pixel C team is working hand in hand with a lot of developers to create some more tablet friendly experiences. So going forward, we should hopefully see some better apps made just for tablets. This is certainly an expensive device at well over $600 if you want the keyboard. Although Android purists looking for great support from both Google and the community should probably just look here first. The keyboard connection definitely needs some work, but once it's ironed out, it'll be amazing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the hardware. And in fact, this is probably my favorite tablet hardware I've ever used. Everything from the design, to the build quality, to the magnetic hinge, to everything else is just awesome. Once that software experience is beefed up quite a bit, this will be the killer Android tablet to get. But the problem here is there's just too many areas where it could potentially be there, and it simply isn't. Yet. Give us a little like if you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe and check out all our other content here and on the site at androidheadlines.com. Don't forget to check us out on Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you're at, we're at. Thanks for watching. Till next time.